these have been challenging times. But the body of Christ has proven itself resilient. We've gathered in different ways, in different places, yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed. Our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient. Well, good morning, Centralia Christian Church. It is just great to be with you again here uh, online, and I'm just excited about just the the message today, and hopefully you're going to be excited about it too. We've been in a three uh, week three of our series called Storyteller, and uh, we've been looking at what an amazing storyteller that Jesus was. He most often told stories in the form of parables, and so it's important for us to kind of go, well then, well, Brad, what are parables? Why are they there? What are they there for? And that word parable means to actually cast alongside something else. So Jesus' parables were stories casted alongside a kingdom truth to help us understand the kingdom truth that Jesus was trying to explain. And, and, and the desire in the heart of this is not so that we just have more intellectual knowledge. It's so that we can make changes to our lives so our lives can be patterned after the kingdom of God. And so last week I talked about the fact for the next three weeks of the series, we're going to really be looking at the kingdom or, or salvation, right? We're going to look at the context of salvation within a few parables here. And last week we teed it off uh, talking about the pearl of great price about the hidden treasure the fact that the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of salvation is this hidden treasure that once we understand the value of it we should be willing to give we should be willing to sell everything that we have to pursue the kingdom of god and so this week we're going to be talking about one of the barriers to salvation barriers to the kingdom of heaven and that is pride and or arrogance and so we don't have to look very far uh, to see pride raise its ugly head, uh, either in our own life or even in the lives of the people around us or even the, in the culture around us. But I do think that this is something that we all struggle with. I know I struggle with it. And, and, and understand pride, its very nature is the desire to lift oneself up, to wanting to puff up oneself. And so many of you are probably familiar with uh, one of the all-time great boxers uh, of all time, Muhammad Ali. And uh, Muhammad Ali, if you ever go back and look on anything on YouTube or anything about him, he would never, has never been accused of being humble. Right? He was somebody who would make these outlandish, arrogant, brash uh, statements, which seemed to be a part of his persona. But uh, I came across a story that I thought was kind of funny, which kind of fits today, where Muhammad Ali was traveling on a commercial airliner, and they ran into some moderate turbulence uh, up in the skies. And for those of you that might be hate flying out there, it's one of those moderate turbulence where, you hey, you need to buckle up your seatbelt because you're probably going to feel like you're going to die, right? But uh, seriously, though, however, the captain, uh, as I read, comes over the intercom and says, hey, everybody, uh, find your seats, buckle your seatbelts. We're going to come across a, pa a patch of uh, turbulence here. And so, uh, you know, so everyone was doing that and except Muhammad Ali. 
right? One of the flight attendants is uh, walking by and, and how I understand it says, she said, Mr. Ali, I'm going to ask you to please comply with the captain's wishes to buckle your seatbelt. And uh, how the story goes is Muhammad Ali audaciously looked at her and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And without missing a beat, she replied, well, Superman didn't need no airplane either. <laughs> but that's what happens when our pride is exposed, right? It makes us look foolish, right? We, we find out that maybe we're not as great as we thought we were or, you know, how we're trying to portray ourselves uh, to be. And yet other people are oftentimes able to see that well before we do. And so Jesus comes and Jesus hits this topic of pride and arrogance and humility head on in, the, in a parable that we're going to discuss today in Luke chapter 18. And so if you have your Bibles, would you please go ahead and open up your Bibles and let's look at Luke chapter 18 and let's look at verses 9 and following. And I'm going to grab my Bible. I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Version today. But here's what it says. It says, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy and unrighteous and adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest. And I can just picture him striking his chest saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I, and so Jesus then says, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, I think it's important for us to kind of look at the context of, of the stories that we read, especially the hair parables because we're not the original audience right almost always the jews uh, it was the audience the audience was the jews of jesus day they would understand things that aren't really readily apparent to us right now and so by us taking the time to understand those things it helps us kind of get a better picture of what was going on and one of those things is this that the bible actually tells us right here who the primary audience of the parable is right it says this it says to some who are confident on their uh, uh, of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. That that's the primary audience is somebody who's proud, somebody who's looking down, right? We also know, according to this, that towards uh, the end of, of that this is happening towards the end of Jesus' ministry, and that's important to note here. Because last week I was telling you, as I was telling you the parable of the hidden treasure, I said at that time, Jesus wasn't confronting the religious leaders, the Pharisees, head on. Why? Because if he had done that, they would want to kill him right away. And Jesus knew that he had more, uh, uh, had more of his ministry to get done, right? Because it wasn't time for him to be glorified yet. But at this point, where Jesus writes this, he's at the end of his ministry. And Jesus kind of tends to become a little more confrontational with the religious leaders. Which is why he uses, in my opinion, a Pharisee in the story. But to understand the full context of the story, my friends, we really need to look at two, the two characters here. We need to look at the Pharisees and we need to look at the tax collector. Because Jesus could have went random guy A and random guy B, right? But he didn't. He picked these two characters for a reason. The first one, the Pharisee, everybody would have been familiar with. The Pharisees were the social, they were the religious group of, the, of people that, that separated themselves. That's what the word Pharisee means, a separated one, right? They separated themselves, how? By trying to live out the law of Moses, God's commands better than anyone else, right? And so my question for you, is that, is that a bad thing? To have a desire to want to live out God's laws better than anyone else? I, I don't think so. They were trying to obey God's commands, which is a good thing. However, I think the problem was in how they did it. They always did it in a way that would allow everyone to see what it was that they were doing so that everybody could congratulate them, so everyone could go, man, those guys are such good rule followers, right? They trusted in their own righteousness, and that is the problem. And everybody at this time would have known this because the fact is the common, re the common people of that day respected the Pharisees because they were such good rule followers, right? And the common people knew that they were supposed to do that as well, but they all would have known that the vast majority of Pharisees were also self-righteous and they believed 
that they were better than everybody else. Hence the reason why a Pharisee is known as separate, right? They weren't common. They were better than everybody else. And this was the problem. And so you have that in contrast with the tax collector. Now, why a tax collector? Well, the tax collectors were hated by the Jews. That the tax collectors of that day were actually Jews as well, but they were considered traitors because what they would do is they would collect taxes from their own people, give those taxes to the hated Romans, and on top of that, the majority of them would actually tax the people more than they were supposed to, and then they would keep that money uh, for themselves. They would skim off the top for themselves. And so they were considered notorious sinners. And again, many of them were. And again, Jesus paints this contrast between these two guys. The tax collector, unlike the Pharisee, who's praying for everyone to see that, you know, that his prayer is different because the Pharisee's prayer, if you'll notice, epitomizes somebody who believes that they're self-righteous, right? Because in this, in his prayer, I, I can't read anywhere. There's not once where he's talking about confession or repentance. Now, now maybe he doesn't even believe there's anything that he needs to be forgiven of, right? There's, but there's no thanksgiving. There's no gratitude except for thank you, God, that I'm such a better person than everybody else, right? Because the prayer is all about him. And you know people like this. You might be like this yourself. But the prayer of the tax collector, on the other hand, I mean, he won't even look up to heaven. He beats his chest. He's like, and he understood the weight of his sin. And he's going, God, he's like, I know there's nothing that I can bring to you that will outweigh, you know, my, my sin. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that's the contrast of the picture that Jesus paints here. Because the fact is, we know the tax collector, by what Jesus preaches here, goes away justified. And that word justify means to be made righteous, made right before God. And that's important because without righteousness, we can't be accepted by God. You and I cannot receive his free gift of salvation, right, without having righteousness. But here's the beautiful thing, that if we come to God like the tax collector did today, that if we'll do that, we know that Christ will treat us in the same way. I want to read to you what it says, what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. It says this, And when you were dead in, in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, referring to your heart, he made you alive with him and forgave us all of our sins. He erased the certificate of death with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. So this incredible, this amazing good news for a group of people, right? This is for a group of people because Paul's not talking to everybody here, right? Paul's talking to Christians, people who are defined as humbling, who have humbly bowed before Christ and said, God, I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my king. Right? And so if you've not done that today, if you've not crossed that line of faith, then I want you to understand that this passage is not actually for you yet, that is. The good news is Christ it has a desire for you to, be, to humble yourselves before him and to accept him and to accept what only he can give you, which is his righteousness. And perhaps you've never done that today. Perhaps, you know, you're somebody who's like, man, I can't come before God yet because my life isn't cleaned up enough. Well, you know what? I want you to notice that in this parable back in Luke, the tax collector didn't wait for his life to be cleaned up. I mean, maybe, maybe you, you're thinking, man, there's no way that God can accept me because Brad, you don't know what I've done, right? There's no way that Brad, that I can earn and measure up to God's, you know, perfect standard. And guess what? Jesus agrees with you because you can't earn it, right? Uh, if you have your Bibles in Matthew uh, chapter 5, I want to, uh, if you will, uh, look there. We see a sermon. We see a teaching uh, the, of Jesus that we call the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus, he was on this hillside. He was teaching his disciples and others were around him as well. But listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, because every single person would have been listening to, 
who would have been listening to that sermon would have been listening or paid attention to this. And this is what he says in Matthew 5, verse 20. He says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so at his, this point, his whole audience is freaking out because, and I can just picture it, because the Pharisees were the best rule followers that they knew. And here Jesus is saying, your righteousness has to be better than that. And he goes on and he tells them how. He says, you know, you've heard it said you're not supposed to murder. Well, I'm telling you that it's a sin if you get angry. You know, you've heard it said you're not, you're supposed, you're not supposed to commit adultery. But I'm telling you it's a sin if you look at somebody lustfully. You've heard it said that you're supposed to love your neighbor. I'm telling you you're supposed to love your enemy. And everybody's going, how, Jesus, can we do this? There's no way. Right? And they're trying to wrap their minds around it. And Jesus doesn't stop there, folks. No, he puts the final nail in the coffin. He puts the, the, the coup de gras in Matthew 5, 48. And this is what he says. He says, remember, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And his audience, I can just imagine they're going, we can't do that. There's no way. And that was the point that Jesus was making. Jesus knew they couldn't do it, right? He didn't tell us those things to, to give us some insurmountable set of rules that would automatically disqualify us without giving us a way out. But here's the bad news. The bad news is that none of us can work hard, hard enough. None of us can go to church enough. None of us can uh, attend Bible study enough or small groups enough or tithe enough or do enough public works to be justified before God. That's the bad news. The good news is that any of us can call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross for us, and we can be made righteous before God. That's the good news. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, The one who knew no sin, referring to Jesus, became a sin offering for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Meaning, not only are we made righteous, but we become the righteousness of God and church and friends that's amazing for anyone who will call on his name but he says if we're so proud that we can't bend a knee he says if we're so proud that we think we can justify ourselves by our own good works then we miss out on salvation we miss out on the kingdom of God and my heart breaks at that but he says, but if we humble ourselves before God, it says that he's faithful and just to receive us into his kingdom, to forgive us of our sins. And so while this passage was certainly focused on salvation and, the re and really what it means to be saved, I find that the Bible talks awful lot about humility and pride and arrogance, even as believers. Because apparently, according to the Bible, we still struggle with it even after we cross the line of faith, right? Because the Bible talks a lot about it. And I find that humility is the exact opposite of pride. Did you know the word uh, humility actually means to have an accurately low view of yourself? To have an accurately low view of yourself, which goes against everything our culture says we're supposed to have, uh, supposed to be about what we're, you know, supposed to have about us. Right? But to have an accurately low view of ourselves. Because here's the thing our nature, my nature is to puff ourselves up. Our nature is to make ourselves look better than we really are, both to ourselves and to those around us. I mean, remember the Pharisees, they started out with the right intentions, but they ended up with the wrong perspective. And that's so easy for us to do the same thing in our lives. It's easy for us to become Pharisees unintentionally, not purposely. Right? And if we're not careful, it happens to the best of us. And here's how it happens to a lot of people. And here's how it happened for me. I'm a recovering Pharisee. In my Christian faith, I can tell you I'm a recovering Pharisee. Because here it is. When I came to know Christ, I, I started learning God's word. And when we're learning what it says, the Holy Spirit starts to work in our life. We start walking in obedience and all of that is good. It's what should happen. The problem happens, though, is when we start looking at other people and we go, hey, look at them. They're not living up to the same standard I'm living up to. They don't walk in obedience the same way that I walk in obedience. And what, what happens is, is we become frustrated with them. And if we're not careful soon, we have contempt for, for all who can't keep up with what we've learned to put into practice ourselves. And when that happens, we're fully on our way 
to becoming a Pharisee. We can end up judging people's behavior without caring for their heart. It's what happened to a bunch of Pharisees. Listen, pride is all about comparing. Pride has to have someone or something to compare to. And I love how C.S. Lewis said this. He said, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more than the next man. We say that people are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. But if everyone else become, became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It's the comparison that makes you proud. It's the pleasure of being above the rest. I think C.S. Lewis had it right on. See, because what I find is we could compare just about anything and look like we have a leg up over people. But when it comes to spiritual comparisons, spiritual comparisons are particularly silly because we don't know the full story. We don't know what somebody else has gone through. We, we don't know where they are now compared to where they've been. I mean, how many of us have ever had a friend who's newly come to Christ and they're rough around the edges and they say things we know that they shouldn't say, they do things we know they shouldn't do, and then they say things about the things that they shouldn't do, right? And the whole time we're going, oh man, I hope my friends, you know, they don't hear him talking like that, oh, right? And here's what we know. They are 10 times better than they were before the Holy Spirit started working in their life, aren't they? The other people don't know that. And that's why we say, man, I hope they don't see or hear this, right? Because you don't want those people to judge your friend, but we can see how God's working in their life. And, and that's the problem with perspective. We all have a perspective of ourselves and others. However, it's just always inaccurate because we're not God. We don't see the whole picture. Here's a good illustration to kind of maybe help us with this. There was a general and his aide who are coming back from uh, the war front after World War II. And so they're riding on the train. And back in those days, trains would have a bench like over here and then a bench over here. And, and, and they would have uh, and they would sit across from each other and they face each other. And you'd actually have to talk to somebody. I know it's kind of weird, right? But they find themselves uh, across from an attractive young lady and her grandmother. And they started talking and they're conversing and things are going really well. And before long, it became apparent that the young lady and the private were attracted to each other. And so they're talking again, everything's going well. And then all of a sudden, they, the, the train goes into this tunnel and it's dark for about 20 to 25 seconds. And two sounds, only two were heard. The sound of somebody getting kissed and the sound of somebody getting slapped in the face. And as they exit the tunnel, they're all sitting there with their thoughts and they're thinking, what just happened? And the young lady, she's sitting there and she's thinking, I'm so honored that this handsome young private thought I was beautiful enough to steal a kiss. I just hope grandma didn't scare him away when she slapped him in the face. And grandma, she's sitting there and she's thinking, the nerve of the, that young man trying to kiss my granddaughter. I'm so glad that she had enough honor and self-respect for herself to put that guy in his place. And the general, he's sitting there thinking, I didn't think that my private had it in him. Good on him, you know, stealing a kiss from a pretty young girl even before we get home. I just wish grandma, when she uh, went to slap him in the face, hadn't missed and hit me. And the private, he's thinking, man, this is the best day ever. Not only did I get to steal a kiss from a pretty girl, I got to slap my commanding officer in the face and no one will ever know. <laughs> right? And that's the problem with perspective. We seldom have all the information. The only person that has all the information is God. And it does take a change of perspective. It does ch take a change of thinking that we're better than somebody else. And so understand that a change of perspective, thinking that we deserve God's grace more than somebody else, it takes that change of perspective. If we're going to walk in humility, then we got to understand that our spiritual comparisons are almost always incredibly biased. And if we're not careful, we can get what I've heard called log eye disease. Lo you heard me right, log eye disease. Does anyone know what that is? Jesus actually talks about log eye disease in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to go back there and hopefully we're going to uh, look at, at verse 1 here through 5. 
And here's what it says in verse 1. Do not judge so you won't be judged, for you will be judged by the same standard with which you judge others, and you'll be measured by the same standards or by the same measure, uh, measure you use. And so, I mean, that right there should just stop us in our tracks because we all know that we've done things, right? We all know we, we've done things. We, and we all know the, the things that we've done we need to be judged for. But Jesus continues in verse 3. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your own eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye. Hypocrite! Right? It says, first take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. You know, I think we just miss what an, an amazing storyteller that Jesus is, right? The crowd at this point would have been laughing on the floor. They would have just been rolling, right? Because one of the ways that Jesus connected with the Jews, with uh, or the way that the Jews connected it with humor, excuse me, was through what's called hyperbole. Huge exaggerations, exaggerations that weren't meant to be taken literally, but they were actually there to make a point. And so Jesus paints this picture. And so he's like this. He's like, hey, imagine somebody, right? Hey, walking around like this. And he walks up onto somebody and says, hey, you have a speck in your eye. Hey, let, let me try to help you with that, right? And, and he's knocking into stuff and he's moving stuff around, right? But, but man, you know, he's like, I can't do that because of this log. You know, if, if this log wasn't in my orbital socket, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. You can see Jesus picking up a log and walking around. But it's a picture that Jesus paints to go, why are you pointing out other people's faults when you've got faults of your own? See, because that's our natural tendency is to elevate ourselves above others. And that's what arrogance does. I mean, how many of you have known somebody like that, that had log eye disease? Maybe it's somebody who wanted to give you parenting advice about their kid, about, you know, and, and uh, they, uh, they want to give you parenting advice and, and their kids are out of control, right? And they come up to you and they say, you know, if you're a little bit more consistent in your discipline, you know, your kids wouldn't act the way that they're acting. And the whole time you're thinking, I know your kids, they're like Satan sidekicks, right? Like, come on. And you're like, really? See, arrogance doesn't see it. And unfortunately, I hate to say this, that I've run the gamut of pride in my life, and I'm not proud to say it at all. And one area that I think is particularly stupid in our culture today is that all I see so many people be so proud of our physical health. Now, again, I'm not saying that nutrition, I'm not saying that working out, I'm not saying exercise doesn't help or that it's not important. But here's what I know that every single one of us is a bad accident or a bad illness away from being flat on our back. I need all of us to understand that our physical health is a gift from God. And it's nothing to be proud of, proud of as if as somehow we have control of that. Right? And, and I just, I kind of wanted to talk about that for just a second. But he, here's, I want to share with you a little bit even more personal with what I struggle with most now. And, and what I struggle with most now is comparing my spiritual maturity to other people's spiritual maturity. It's pretty much the same thing that the Pharisees got condemned for, right? I mean, after all, I'm a recovering Pharisee. So it's hard for me to, to totally kick this. But here's the thing. What I'm about to say, I don't say proudly. But here's the truth. I'm more spiritually mature than some. In fact, I better be because of what was handed to me. I've had two parents that raised me in the church from birth. They did their best to show me what it means to be a Christ follower. My parents stayed together their entire lives until my mother passed away last November. I've had the, the honor, I've had the Holy Spirit active in my life for over 38 years. I've had amazing, amazing, amazing people pour into me. And so... I better be more spiritually mature than some, right? But let me tell you something. That's not something to be proud of. That's something to be thankful to God for. That, that God would see to invest in me in that way. Because here's the thing. 
what's the one thing you struggle with today? What's the one thing you're like, I look down on other people because they're not as good as me in this area? Because the fact is, we all do it. We all act like this. We, we look down on others. It, it's such a poor example of what's supposed to mean to be a Christ follower, right? I mean, how many of you have known what I like to call a jerk for Jesus? Anybody? Yeah, it might be somebody who tells everybody that, that they follow Christ, but they're not kind. They're not gracious. They're not somebody that anybody wants to be around because why? They're not a nice person. Or maybe that's uh, maybe it's somebody that goes around bad-mouthing all other Christians or all the, all other churches in town, right? Because they don't you know preach the Bible this way or they don't do this or they don't do that. Maybe it's somebody who thinks they're really advancing the kingdom of God by peeping by by beating people over the head with the Bible and telling them all the things that they're doing wrong and that if they don't shape up, they're going, they have a one, one ticket uh, direction straight to hell. See, the funny thing about, I find about these people are, is that a lot of times these people think they're being persecuted for their faith and that's not the case. They're just being persecuted for being a jerk. And see, the problem is, it's not that what they're saying isn't true. Because God in his word does call us to obedience. And there are consequences that when we don't obey, right? But they're just not listing the whole truth. They're not remembering the whole truth, right? Because the whole truth is that we're also supposed to walk in grace and mercy and gentleness and love. And something else that I find that I think is a shame is that most of us don't think our pride is that serious of a problem, Right? Most of us, I think, would rather admit to a problem that we have a problem with pornography addiction or a substance abuse addiction. Why? Because we just don't really think pride is that big of a deal. And yet that's not what God thinks. God hates pride, right? It single-handedly is the thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven and made Satan uh, God's mortal e e enemy for life. It was his arrogance. In, Pro in Proverbs chapter 6, it says there are six things that God hates, seven that he detests. And you want to know what the number one thing on the list is? It's haughty eyes, proud eyes that look down on other people. In James 4, 6, it says he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Did you hear that? That God actually squares off and God actually opposes the proud. And the fact is, is we all struggle with that. Believe me. I mean, listen, God is the last individual in the universe that you want opposing you. Right? Pride made the top of the list of things that God hates. And in that previous passage, it's a it's the front of the line sin that many of us don't take very seriously. And here's the deal, did you know this? Probably didn't, but maybe you did that God wants to expose our pride. Why? Why would he want to do that? Because he knows how damaging it is. And so the question I got to ask right now is, do you want him to expose your pride? Because it's almost always takes something that will humble us to expose it. And so maybe you're one of those that sits back and says today, Brad, I really do want to have my pride exposed. I need to talk to God about it, right? And so the question is, how do we overcome pride? If it's something we all struggle with, how do we overcome our pride? And I think there's a couple of ways, and one of them is by actually reading the Bible the way it was intended. You know, the first time that I was presented with this illustration was in a book called Accidental Pharisees by Larry Osborne. And he talks about the fact that the Bible is supposed to be read like you're looking uh, into a mirror, okay? So like you're looking into a mirror. And so I, I got this nice little cool mirror here, uh, here that you can see. But it's, so I'm sitting here, and, and, and as you read the Bible, you should be looking at what, what you're reading and you're going, hmm, how does that apply to me? So I'm looking here into my mirror, right? But, but here's the deal. You, you don't look at them. You don't use a mirror to look at other people, right? You, you use a mirror and, and you're like, oh, oh, how long has that been there? But instead of reading God's word like a mirror, most of us, and I didn't bring this, but I should have, want to read God's word like we have a pair of binoculars. And we're looking around and we're like, wow, how long has that been there? Wow, those people got us some cleaning up to do. Wow, that is sin. That guy's sin over there, it is ugly. Right, he, that guy, he's got some, he's got to do something about, 
right? We would much rather use the Bible to look at other people's faults than to look at our own life and go, God, what needs to be cleaned up in my own life? Because here's the thing, 2 Timothy tells us that God's word is good for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training, but more often than not, we would much rather do that with somebody else's than with life than with our life first. And the second thing I think we can do is to have a proper understanding of obedience. Because I find that I and other people, we like to congratulate ourselves for how well we obey God's laws as if God's laws are some kind of horrendously, horrifically difficult uh, set of laws that we have to obey. Like it's so hard and it takes so much energy in our life to follow God's laws. But seriously, I mean, we think we do that a lot of times, right? We're like, I'm blessing God so much with my obedience. But here's the thing. When we obey better than somebody else, that's not a reason to be proud, right? Obedience is better than not obedience. Would you agree with me? I mean, that's good. But listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, verses 7 uh, through 9, and what he said about obedience. And, and as I get there, it's just interesting to me. It just kind of blows my mind away a little bit. But Luke chapter 17, 7 through 9 says this, which one of you having a servant tending sheep or plowing will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. Instead, will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat, get ready and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you can eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. You know, I struggle sometimes with that. Because the, the point of the parable and the story there from Jesus is there's no reason to pat ourselves on the back when we're being obedient. That's our duty. We don't get to look at other people and go, man, I'm sure obeying better than that person is. Because here's the thing, when we're obedient, it's actually a blessing for us. It's not a blessing for God. God didn't give us a list of rules to kill our fun. He gave us a list of rules so that we could live our best life ever. We're supposed to walk in obedience. Not just, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's nothing, when we obey, it's nothing to pat ourselves on the back about. And so here's what I hope you walk away with here today. That pride is a prison. It's the most dangerous part. And again, the most dangerous part of that prison is that we would not humble ourselves. That we would think that we somehow have something to offer God outside of Jesus that we can justify, uh, that would justify us before him. Right? But it's another prison. Pride's another, a prison in another way as well. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a prison that per perpetrates anger and hurt and foolishness while keeping at bay the restorative effects of conviction and humility and forgiveness and restoration. Friends, I love how Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he's talking about how we're supposed to think and act in regards towards humility. And he said this, verse 3 of chapter 2 of Philippians, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more important than yourselves. Man, that's tough. Everybody should look not out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. He says, if we'll do that, then we'll, we're well on our way to walking in humility instead of unintentionally becoming a Pharisee and walking in our pride. So my friends, as, as I close this out, my hope is that the Holy Spirit has been working on you during this message and saying, gosh, so-and-so, here's, here's an area where sometimes you're proud and you need to give that to me. Maybe today you're somebody that's like, I don't think that I'm great. I think everybody else is better than me. Well, let me throw a little bit of self-focus on that too because I find that there's some pride in that statement as well. But honestly, for most people, we all struggle with this. And here's some questions that I can ask myself this weekend that you can ask yourself this weekend and that you can ask your, and what you can ask yourself is this. Have I forgotten how horrible my sin is and how good God's mercy is? 
Have I forgotten how horrible my sin is and how good God's mercy is? Because it is certainly easy for you to see how horrible everybody else's sin is. Here's another thing you can ask yourself. Do I have a thank God I'm not like them list? Right? Maybe it's something as subtle as thank God I'm not a horrible driver like them, hypothetically speaking. Right? Maybe it's something more direct like thank God I don't struggle with their sin because, you know, I don't think my sins are as bad as their sins. Right? Either way, we're looking down on other people. We're looking at ourselves as if we're more than them. Here's another question. What tempts you to feel superior? I know it tempts me to feel superior, but what tempts you? Right? Maybe you don't even know that maybe you need to ask God to expose that in you. Because the fact is he wants to take that away from you because of what it can do in your life. The damage it can make. And so here's some things you can do to kill pride and allow humility to grow this week. One is... Remind yourself daily when you get up and when you go to bed what it costs Jesus to take away your sin. Do it in the middle of the day. Do it at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right? I don't know. But the next time you start to think, I don't think my sin is that bad, remember your sin, my sin, put Jesus on the cross. It is so horrific that the only way that it can be getting rid of was through the death of our Savior. I don't know. Maybe maybe you need to ask. Your, maybe you need to uh, uh, Maybe you need to humble yourself and you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe from God, maybe from somebody else this week. Maybe maybe this week you need to actually extend forgiveness, right? Because that takes humility too. Maybe this week you need to give grace. You know, are you someone who's easily offended? Are you somebody who's just waiting for somebody to do some, something wrong so you can go, I knew it! Because God gives you grace every single day. He gives me grace every single day. And we're supposed to be grace givers just like Christ is. Or finally, what are some ways that you can put other people first this week? See, because I know my tendency is to put myself first. And that verse we just read in Philippians says we're supposed to think others of others better than ourselves. And we're to look for ways to serve people and not have them serve us. You know, as I close today, I don't know what decision that you have to make for Jesus. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's working on you on. But I have two questions for you. What is God saying to you today? And the second question is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And so I want to encourage you that if you haven't given your life to Christ, or maybe during this time you said, I want to give my life to Christ. I've given my, my heart to him. I want him not only be my savior, but my Lord. Please email me at office at centraliachristian.org and let me know that you've done that so that I can call you and follow up with you on this. I'm excited if you've done that today. For those of us who are believers in Christ, sometimes we could have more Pharisee in us than we realize. And I don't believe it's always intentional. Oftentimes it's unintentional, but we have to look at our pride in our life and understand that God really wants to talk with you about that. It's one of the top sins he hates. Haughty eyes, proud eyes, looking at, 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 at yourself being better than others. So there's a lot to think of. I want to encourage you, download the notes on the website where you find this at centraliachristian.org. Use those questions at the bottom to help you walk through your week as well. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for this time together. I ask that you would just bless those who are watching this uh, today. Lord, would you give them strength? Would you give them uh, uh, a broken heart, a humble heart before you, God, that as your Holy Spirit works in their life and works on their life, works through their life, that God, they would... Uh, be open to you, that they would give their life to you, God, that, that as you speak to them in areas that they need to change, that they would say, God, thank you that you love me enough to help me change this in my life, that you want what's the best life that I can have while being in the world, but not of it. Thank you, Father God, for being that kind of God who loves us so much. I ask that you would just continue to bless our, our family, bless, bless, bless our brothers and sisters around the world, God. 
Lord, I ask that you be with our persecuted brothers and sisters as well. You give them confidence and strength in their faith, knowing that they found the hidden treasure and they're willing to give everything and sell everything in order to keep it. May they be an encouragement to us as well in our faith. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I love you guys, and I look forward to next week, uh, and I hope you are too. Hope you're enjoying the series, uh, The Storyteller, and man, just be ready for what God has in store for us. Love you guys. Have a great day.